Hello there and welcome back to the Closet Historian and back to my sewing room where today we're going to be making the skirts for the Carmine gown. Last time I finished up the Victorian bodice for this costume and today I'll be jumping into making the skirts, constructing the foregore underskirt from Truly Victorian and one of their overskirt patterns to wear with it. Um, this is the asymmetrical add-on overskirt which you can sew together with the foregore underskirt pattern but I decided to sew them both separately so I could technically mix and match these pieces if I ever felt like it, if I wanted to wear this with a black underskirt someday or anything like that, I wanted to be able to have that option. But since both of these skirt patterns are actually rather straightforward, let's go ahead and jump on in and I'll show you how I got on. So I had used these two patterns before in working on the cicada gown, and I'm go going to be using the same underskirt pattern here, so I cut that out of the black muslin and the fashion fabric, the quilting cotton here, and then I will just go ahead and layer all the pieces for that and then um, <laughs> base them along the edges, which is what I'm trying to showcase here with my funny hand movements, Fanna whiting it over here. But um, I'm just going to run those through the serger actually to base them together instead of even running them through the machine just because this would finish the raw edges and base these two pieces or layers together all in one step here. And uh, I would never do this with the silk. Silk on the cicada gown, for example, I definitely hand basted. But for this more rough and tumble cotton, I felt it could handle it, especially because not much of the underskirt is even seen. So if anything got out of hand, it would be fine. And then I transferred over the darts for the top of the skirt, just following along with that truly Victorian pattern. Um, trace those with the tracing wheel and some chalk paper, and then I'm just pinning those darts closed with some of my fine pins here. So I can go ahead and sew these together. Everything's all flat lined now, just surged together to do that. But I can go ahead and sew my darts to the top of this. I am just following the Truly Victorian pattern quite closely here. Um, I felt it worked really well when I was making the cicada gown, so I trusted it to work well in cotton as well. No problem. Work well in as well. What? what? Getting all kinds of tongue tied. It is nearly time for my afternoon coffee. I am a coffee twice a day kind of a person. Um, it's a, a habit of mine. Although I did switch from having sugar in my coffee to honey a little while back, so I try and feel a tiny bit less bad about it, uh, just because I'm not drinking as much sugar, hopefully. We'll see. Uh, it's still, you know, sugar juice and it is delicious. <sighs> but here, now that my darts are sewn, I can start sewing the front center panel of this foregore underskirt, which, like the name suggests, is only four pieces plus a waistband, um, together along the long side seams here. So I'm just pinning those and sewing those together. There's some darts in the front and then a little bit of shaping along these kind of front almost princess seams, I guess you would call them, of the skirt-ish. They're in the same sort of alignment as like a princess seam would be, I suppose, so it makes some sense. And then I will just press those seams open as I sew them as well. And the top of them is a bit curved like an A-line skirt would be, so I mean this is basically just a huge A-line skirt with a gathered back, so where I just placed those two pins is where this skirt on this particular seam will be left open to. There's just a uh, side opening left. You can put a placket in there too. I never really bothered just because it's usually covered by the overskirt and never seen anyway. So you just leave a portion of the top of the skirt on one of these seams open and that's where the waistband opens up and that's how you get in and out of the skirt. So that looks a little bit like this. I'm just going to fell down that folded edge to the interlining here so none of these stitches will show on the outside but uh, I can have this finished nice opening for getting in and out of this skirt. Uh, of course, again, this is never seen because it's covered up, but you could put a placket in here if you wanted to. I think there's instructions for doing that. I'm not sure in the Julie Victorian pattern, but I didn't bother with a cicada gown nor this one either. And then here I have my waistband so I can start now that the skirt is assembled, pinning it onto the waistband. I did um, reinforce this. This is just a single layer of the quilting cotton. So I reinforced it with some fusible interfacing. And I'm just pinning on all the flat bits and making sure my seams stay open and my darts stay flat and smooth. And then the back of this, the Truly Victorian pattern just instructs you, instructs you to pleat it down to the waistband. So I like to find the center of the rest of my skirt here, pin that down to the center of the back of the waistband, which is what this is. And then I knife pleat uh, just roughly, like about one inch pleats, kind of just eyeballing it or feeling my way around um, towards the center back on each side. So. Um, you could go away from the center back on each side. You could just knife pleat all the way across the back. You could do box pleats. Um, clearly it doesn't really matter what you end up doing, uh, especially again, if you're going to be wearing an overskirt over this and, um, truly Victorian doesn't tell you a specific way to do it. So I assume any way you do it, it has to floof over your bustle anyway. So I just chose this method because it seemed to make sense to me, I suppose. And again, we're almost already done with the foregore underskirt here. So this will be a quicker video today. That's for sure. Sorry about that. I'm not very good at splitting my costuming apart. Uh, the bodices take so much time and the skirts, uh, are, although time consuming, are less steps because they are less pieces, I suppose, and less steps overall total. 
but here I can stitch that onto the waistband, just half inch seam allowance as usual here. But I was thinking a little bit about how um, someone in the 1880s, let's say mid um, 1880s, in my area would have like made or uh, acquired a gown like this one. And I don't think the area I live in, um, probably the nearest town at that time would have been Littleton, Colorado, which wasn't actually incorporated as a town until like the turn of the century, I believe. Um, and even then when it was incorporated into a town, I think there was only 250 people living here. So it was a, a small place. Um, even then, Denver was a bit more populated, of course, after all the gold and silver booms that were happening up in the mountains here when this area was colonized or settled um, or taken over, you know. Um, this was originally mostly uh, where I live now, um, Arapaho and Cheyenne land, I believe, and then also sometimes Ute territory, um, although the Ute uh, Native Americans lived mostly in the Rocky Mountain region, um, but I think they did um, come down here onto the plains as well. So there are many people living here before Europeans got here, um, people who would be wearing dresses like this, I suppose. But in the 1880s, there was a dry goods store already opened in Littleton. Um, I don't think they would have had dressmakers in Littleton at that time, just because, again, it was such a... I mean, they had maybe a saloon, and they barely had a... They didn't have, an, like, a, a permanent post office yet. Like, there wasn't a post office building. It was just, like, in an office in one of the other buildings. There wasn't a lot going on in my area of Colorado <laughs> at the time in the 1880s. So um, that the railroad, I think the Santa Fe Railroad only came through here um, and around that time. So uh, the Railway Depot, where I will shoot pictures of this costume when I'm done at the end of this video, um, there's a little ra ra railroad depot with a 1890s caboose parked near the Littleton like Courts building. And that's where I shot pictures for this costume. You'll see that at the end. Um, and that railroad uh, depot building it's a wooden building um, that's still kept intact here and used as an art gallery now, but that building was built in 1888, so even after the era of this costume, there's just, there wasn't a ton going on in my area here, so uh, a woman probably would have had to make her own dresses and perhaps would have bought calico cotton similar enough to this quilting cotton at the dry goods store if she wanted to make something, but she probably could have had things mail ordered perhaps into town or dry, uh, driven, and when I say driven, I mean by horse into town, into Denver to get um, fashion magazines or things like that, or possibly to visit a dressmaker, maybe down in Denver, in town as it were. But these were some of the gowns, of course, that were inspiring me. Um, again, this V&A dress on the left-hand side with its layers of little pleated trimming. And then this dress in the middle has a similar skirt treatment going on only in straight lines. And then this last gown on the right has a bit deeper uh, pleated trim that was inspiring me to do a couple of rows of pleats onto my underskirt as well. So I took a seven inch strip of my fabric here I just cut that along the straight grain. Um, you can see the salvage on this even, that I am turning uh, twice at quarter of an inch. I mean, I'm eyeballing it, but around a quarter of an inch. Just turning it twice along one edge to hem the like bottom edge of the pleats, I suppose. So I'm just gonna do all that first. This strip is about, oh, maybe two and a half, three yards long. I didn't actually measure. Um, I just took whatever fabric I had left and cut a seven inch strip to see how long after I pleated it down it would be. And it ended up being about two or three inches short to go all the way around the bottom of my skirt. So I patched in a little bit, but this worked out pretty well for me. I was just kind of flying by the seat of one's pantaloons once again um, to do this. But I marked every, uh, once I had that edge hemmed, I marked every inch with pins like this again. <laughs> you know, pleat in whichever way feels best to you. Uh, but this just seemed like it would be best and fastest to me. Again, you can buy uh, pleaters or you could use a fork to pleat things I've heard, but I just measured one inch on either side and then pleated it a half inch every other inch or every inch. You know what I mean? You can kind of see what I'm doing. I just pleated this down. I, I only measured a little bit every inch there, um, but just used a lot of pins to arrange things as I liked. Then I pinned it to the ironing board itself before I, I um, pressed this. And then I had seen on another costuming blog um, of someone who was making a more faithful recreation of that V&A dress. I will link that um, blog post below. But um, they said to spray the pleats with a little bit of water and vinegar in a spray bottle. So you can see the spray bottle at the top of the screen here. This is just diluted vinegar, um, just like a, maybe, I don't know, a, a splash of vinegar in water and just sprayed that on the pleats and pressed them down and hope for the best, you know, pretty much. I don't really intend to wash this gown. I don't wear things off, you know, in costumes often enough to have to launder them and redo the pleating or anything like that. So um, even if I wore this out and about, I probably wouldn't wash these skirts. I would wear just wash the bodice because the bodice, everything is pre-washed. So I could give that a little bit of a soak or spray it with vodka, 
for a refreshing. Um, but again, I don't wear my costumes very often, as we know. I make them more for the art of it, for the fun of it, for all of you to watch, um, for the challenge. It's a nice to stretch myself to make something a little bit more artistic and epic than, you know, my normal 1940s and 50s dresses. So once I had the pleats um, basted kind of together, I went ahead and figured out where they needed to be. This is about six inches up from the hem, pinned them in place, made sure everything was smooth and ran that through the machine. And then I did the whole process again and pleated another strip and sewed it on again, another five inches up from this one so that they just overlapped a little bit, two strips of pleating on my hem of my overskirt here. But this is the first one. Looking real fun here. <sighs> Sewing it onto the skirt was easy. Pleating it down was the hard part. And then I have my overskirt here. This is the, again, truly Victorian draped, uh, asymmetrical draped overskirt pattern that I think you can just add on into the same waistband as the forewar underskirt. Um, that's kind of what the instructions are implying that you will do, but I just put it on a separate waistband so that I can wear this separately, I suppose. Um, but I'm just following the pleating pattern. Again, I'm following the truly Victorian pattern quite closely. Um, when I made the cicada gown, I used this front drape piece for both the front and the back of the overskirt. And this time I used the proper back overskirt pattern that comes with this pattern. So I followed the pattern directly this time instead of going off book like I did with the cicada gown. Um, so this time I just wanted to follow the pattern exactly. Um, I think truly Victorian patterns are all based off of historic patterns or um, historic methods, so that's kind of nice. And then I was starting to pleat this down and realized I should probably hem this thing first. <laughs> so I took some more bias tape matching the fashion fabric and hemmed all the edges that I needed to. There's like a free falling um, edge of this overskirt and then the hem itself of like the bottom edge. It's kind of, again, asymmetric, so hard to explain, but there's some free edges that hang loose and they needed to be hemmed nicely so that it looks good on the front and the back because of course, if there was a breeze, you would see the underside of these hanging bits of the overskirt, so I wanted to make sure it looked nice. So I machined, sewed the um, eh, bias binding, and eh, I could talk, on here, and then I turned it to the inside, ironed it smooth, and hand stitched it down. Um, and I did that for both the front and back of the overskirt here, um, and then I could resume pleating, but here I'm just folding that bias onto the inside, and again, I will stitch that to just the interlining so no stitches will show on the outside. For this sort of thing. Um, the nice thing about the cotton layers, the muslin really stuck well to the quilting cotton, so these layers didn't separate that um, much once they were flatlined. <laughs> Again, my brain. It clearly is coffee time. Like I've mentioned, must be time to go grab a cup of coffee. But yes, I was thinking about areas around town that would be a good place to photograph this gown. Of course, there are a lot of like um, proper, I don't know, Wild West or Old West, let's say, mining towns and um, even ghost towns up in the mountains here in Colorado, um, outside of Denver. But I never really know if it's appropriate to take, like it's it's hard to know where it's appropriate to uh, photograph, you know, play clothes like this, just because, um, you know, those towns represent a, you know, stealing of land and of resources out of the land. And, uh, you know, a, a part of American history that did happen and is important to remember, but it's not always the nicest. And um, so it's hard to know if it's appropriate to go and take fun Wild West pictures in these places. I've never gone to like Wild West days or any of these towns or anything like that, just because I'm never like, I'm always like, is it an amusement park? Is it history? I don't really know what's going on. You can let me know what it's like in your area of the world with that kind of thing, where it's like preserving historic history things, even though some of the history is okay, maybe fun or interesting, uh, certainly interesting, but also dark and, you know, twisted and or, uh, wrong uh, in some ways. So there's a, always a mix because nothing in history is black and white, of course. But um, here I am stitching all the pleated sections down. Again, this is just pleated according to the truly Victorian pattern. The pleating on the back overskirt of this, once again, they're like, do these two floopy pleats that I had never heard of before and then pleat the rest however you would like. So I really kind of just winged it, um, but there was not clear, er, the front of the overskirt has perfectly clear pleating instructions. The back you really kind of have to half make it up. So that's what I did. Um, but mostly following that truly Victorian pattern where it was being instructional and when it was leaving me high and dry, just kind of making it up and winging it. Um, so a mix of both there, but now I'm attaching it to a waistband of its own here, um, which is good because the bodice did come out a little bit big. So to have, once I start tried it on overneath, oh, overneath, over top the like petticoat, underskirt and overskirt all tied on, um, it fit a little bit better because honestly, my costuming, if anything, including wearing my corset, adds a little bit onto my waistline. Um, it's not very uh, slimming, this costume in the end, but it is very fun, so I will make an exception. 
I just make costumes for the fun of it, really. Uh, sometimes people ask me, like, what am I making things for? And normally the answer is, uh, I make things for my own wardrobe and I wear them out and about. But something like this. Really, I only uh, intend to wear it just for Halloween. So hopefully we can start having a plague-free Halloween again and can actually do things like, you know, go to the pumpkin patch without masks and, I don't know, see our friends and go to corn mazes and hay rides, etc. Strange fun things we do for Halloween around here. I just had a few tiny things to fix up on the bodice before I could model this costume or wear this costume for its first, uh, you know, outing out and about <laughs> for a brief moment. Luckily, there was no one around. Um, but I had made these little thin pads to put in the top of the bodice of this above the bust sort of area. It just fills in the hollow above the bust uh, between like the neck and the chest. Um, and these are a period detail to have. And then I just cut some um, layers of muslin here into big ovals. I'm going to surge around the raw edges of that and just tuck these in, tack them in as... Uh, underarm shields, which again was a something that they did in the period as well, just because when you're having to launder your fancy gowns, you kind of want to launder them as little as possible so you can tack these sort of things in and then clip them out as need be. But then all that was left for this costume was to acquire a little bit of Victorian bling, perhaps, and so I did go ahead and poke around on Etsy and see, see what I could get for, uh, you know, not much. I wanted to try and find a little brooch to close my collar with, and so I ended up with this little, I'm sure it's like stamped brass, maybe it was plated at one time, but it does seem to be rubbing off little collar brooch here. It was actually smaller even than I expected when it arrived in the mail, but it is quite cute and small. And then I ended up getting some, um, not historic, but very cute cicada earrings on Etsy as well. Love, you know how I love Etsy. And then lastly, I found, while I was searching for collar brooches, this um, morning jet brooch that is in the shape of a feather and this is actually again a historic like antique probably turn of the century uh, maybe late Victorian to 1920s piece I'm not exactly sure when this is from but it is like flat backed black glass I assume uh, I don't think it's jet because it's cool to the touch so it must be glass um, on a little brass base here again these are just little uh, wire C clasps they're not very uh, fancy but they are very fun and I'm very happy to have both of these brooches in my collection now, especially because my vintage costume and jewelry collection doesn't go that far back, but we can maybe expand in the historic direction. And then the last accessory I needed for this costume was, of course, a hat, something to top the whole thing off, but I will show you that in more detail in another video soon. So here is the carmine gown all finished with the bodice and the skirts, the underskirt and the overskirt, of course. Uh, luckily the skirts don't take necessarily as much time as the bodice does. There's a few less fiddly steps and the seams are longer so you can almost get into more of a groove. The most time consuming part of these skirts I would say are definitely the pleating. Um, just doing the pleats by hand of course takes a long time and uh, there are much faster ways to do that sort of thing but because I don't make a lot of costumes or do a lot of pleats like this, I suppose. I really didn't want to invest in anything extra. I just wanted to use my ruler and my hands. I did just get home from doing the photo shoot for this costume, so I've just thrown on some pajamas here and tried to fix up my hat hair as best as possible. And yes, 
The green has disappeared, although you will be seeing a glimpse of it one more time next week because I already filmed the intro and outro and bits for the hat making video for this costume. So you'll be seeing how I put the hat together next week. And in general, I will be pre-filming my next couple of videos here before I take off on an adventure. I will be bringing the camera along and I've got even a new GoPro to try and use and figure out how to use um, on this adventure because I'll be heading out on the road and I will be taking you with me as much as I possibly can, but hopefully you won't notice that I'm gone here on the channel because videos will still be going up as usual while I'm away. I do have a little bit more costuming planned for later this year and I'll finally be leaving my giant bustle behind for something a little bit uh, further into the future as it were. So I'll dive into that when I get back, but until then thank you as always for watching this video today and I will see you again here of course real soon. Bye! An extra special thanks to Alice, Che, Karina, Denise, Ellen, Eloquent Silence, Carol, Lynn, Margaret, Maria, Nancy, Rachemus, Rhonda, Swingularity, Tom, and Tracy for making this costume and my channel possible. Thank you to all of my patrons and all of you who support me here on the channel. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you again soon. Bye.